you very much for joining us. Uh, we have great pleasure to uh, welcome Tariq Walalu from Walalu Choi to be here with us today, all day and during juries and uh, seeing the campus and now giving us a talk. Uh, I'll introduce Tariq. He was born in Rabat in Morocco, 1977, received his degree from the ENSA in Paris Malaké. Uh, in addition, he holds a degree in art history from uh, Ecole du Louvre and a degree in civil engineering from the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers in Paris. His previous experiences ranged from Kennedy and Weilish in Boston, Anderson Schwartz in New York, and in 2001 he founded with Lena Choi the architecture firm Wallalu and Choi. Uh, so the office won multiple awards, uh, the last of which was the Arab Architects Award last January. The office has a regular, is a regular participant and curator of multiple cultural productions in international venues such as Seoul Biennale, Venice Biennale, and Dubai Expo, to name a few. Uh, and in, for the past years, uh, Wallalu and Choi has been questioning um, the necessities of architecture and its remaining possibilities. Uh, themes like resistance, disobedience, and confrontation have been occurring uh, preoccupations in their work. So we would like to hear today Tariq to uh, propose and discuss possible strategies of how can we make architecture relevant again. Um, really like something that uh, is a preoccupation for all architects and for architecture, our department in particular. So please, the floor is yours. Please join me in welcoming Tariq. Thank you very much, Sandra, for kind of like this. Yes. Do you actually need this? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you, Aram and Nicola, for your hospitality today. I feel very privileged to be here. Um, I hadn't been in Beirut in almost eight years. And uh, it's a city I love but don't understand very well. Um, and I'm happy to share a little bit of our work with you. I'm gonna try to do this quickly, 45 minutes or so, and uh, try to have a conversation with you, uh, if you want. Um, there's a weird thing about architecture, is that, and the students today showed this very well, is that we are convinced that the project has a medicinal role. We analyze a place, and the project is going to solve everything. It's a medicine to the territory, to the communities. Um, the reality is that architecture is very rarely a betterment. It's most of the time a deterioration of the places, of the communities, of the bodies around. And the strange part of this is that we know it. We're um, all complicit. This is why I'm showing this picture of a system that produces architecture. And we try to convince ourselves that uh, this system can be fought from within, that we can change it. But the reality is that this system is the one bringing this planet to um, the brink of the end of its climate. That makes almost impossible the organization of our communities and tribes and put our bodies in impossible solutions and positions. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is I've always been fascinated um, in the past 20 years with Lina. We try to understand how come we come from this notion that what we do is good, but the result of it is always bad. So maybe one way to do it is to not do it anymore, or to teach it, or to find ways in which we only do things where we're not engaged. Our position is that we try to find ways in which we engage, but in a way where we're not blind. Um, I show this image because um, the Deleuze had beautiful fr uh, phrases when he said, we never believe in what we know. We know fundamentally that our generation is going to be working in a completely different climate. It's not about footprint or lead gold or any kind of certification. Um, we have to imagine that our lives, the lives of our kids and our grandkids, will change tremendously. 
So architecture isn't about reducing or thinking that it's not going to happen, but really finding ways in which we're going to live in a much more complicated geographies. We're living a realm where we are seeing the sixth extension of this earth, meaning in 100 years, 80% of what was living is not living anymore. There's no mosquitoes anymore, there are no more bees, there are no more fishes, there are no more animals. Architecture, in my view, has to be a testimony to what's alive. And I'll be talking about this later on, but we consider every single of the, our projects to be a form of uh, Désarche de Noé, Noah's Arcs. It's also a generation where our biologies are changing. I'm not just talking about smartphone and hip replacement. I'm talking about the possibilities of the technologization of biology and what it changes in our perception of space, dimension, relationships, everything that architecture is made of. It's also a generation where the relationship to work changes. Work is a very recent um, notion. It's about 100 and 150 years, work as we know it. But we're going to have plenty of time on our hands. We're going to be finding it very difficult to fill it. And architecture is only uh, is only the result of this uh, tradition of work. And definitely, we're going to see the slowdown of history. If the past 150 years has been everything accelerating, everything getting smaller, everything going faster, that has stopped. And we're going to live the next 25 years of moment of uh, ralentissement. And maybe the, what we live through the pandemics is just a preview of this. So out of all of this, uh, we consider our work to be a form of resistance. When I say resistance, this is, I'm not using these images as uh, lightly. Um, I know what they mean. Uh, we worked in complicated places. Um, the first building we ever built was in Palestine, and it's the first building that's ever been demolished. Um, we've all been engaged in the places we work in, but it has to be clear that if architecture has to happen, and it may not need to happen, but if it has to happen, it needs to take into account some of the elements we talked about. Our office is organized in two different ways. We have an office and we have a foundation, a place where we can explore, we do research, we teach, we have a speculative sense of um, time. And building and thinking are two, um, two parts of a very strong necessity of ours, but they can rarely work together with the space of fabrication of architecture and the space of fabrication of speculative thinking are two different rhythms. And all we try to do is try to percolate them as much as possible. What I'll do with you today is as quickly as I can, not talk about one or two projects in excruciating detail, but I'm just gonna try to show you many things and try to have basis for a conversation. We're gonna talk about how we could build in nature, with nature, for nature. This is a project um, that defined who we are. You know, every office has one. Um, this is ours. Um, but 12, 15 years ago, we were asked to build the museum of the Roman site of Volubilis. In Volubilis, I know uh, Lebanon has so many beautiful uh, archeological sites. Volubilis has this quality of have not been changed in 2,000 years. The way a Roman left it is the way it is. Nothing is built around it. The plan du Zerron with the grapes and the cypresses and the wheat is all there. The only thing that was there was a few buildings that the French built in the early 20s. In this area of the site that you see here, where the Roman didn't build anything. The Roman, not being as stupid as the French, knew that that site was unstable. So. The, the French building were there, they were beyond repair, and it took us many, many years to convince UNESCO to demolish them and to build something new. It was quite important to us to do that because there hasn't been a single museum built uh, since uh, Morocco became independent in 1956. And UNESCO said, if it's there, it's good. If it's old, it's good. If it's there, we repair it. And not only we couldn't repair it, but we decided that we shouldn't repair it, that there needed to be something else that needed to happen there. What we wanted to do is find a way where we 
don't build a building, but we build a landscape inside uh, the, the city. The building we proposed, its highest point is lowest than the lowest point of the entry. So it's a building that is buried in places and suspended in others. We had extraordinarily little money to do this. Um, so it's a building that took us about, thank you for the light, it's much better. Mm -hmm. it took us about 10 years to build. Okay. Um, and the reason why some buildings are beautiful is because they take time. And in this case, what we did is to build a very long dam that's 300 meters long to hold the ground and then to start attaching a concrete building uh, all along it. What we wanted to do is to build not a ruin, not something that resembles Roman uh, remains, but to have the ruin embedded inside the building so that you can see the building and you can see the, its layers disappearing in time. The first layer would be the wood, and then it would be the glass, and then the stone, and the, the last bit would be the... No, it was much better before. Uh, and then it would be the concrete. Building a ruin in becoming, in a space where all we need to do is fabricate shade, we did that by using the most basic construction system. We just had concrete, and we had incredible, beautiful cedar um, Wood. And obviously, uh, with very little money, what we decided to do is build very expensive formwork um, made out of this very expensive wood. We poured the concrete in it, and then we took out the formwork, we cleaned the wood, we let it dry for three years, and then we use it to um, make it the facade of the building. This relationship to the ground and the way we're embedded in it has a lot to do with um, the way we define ourselves. I, when I talk about architecture, I always consider it the relationship that humans build between the ground and the sky. Everything is about that space in between and the definition that it is. In this relationship to nature, we have a, an agenda in its relationship to materials and how we spend a lot of time taking the clothes off our buildings. We do very naked buildings. Um, as raw as they can be. We were asked to do the Moroccan Pavilion at the international exhibition in, in Dubai. And for us, Dubai is an anomaly. It's a place that shouldn't exist. It's a, you know, the remnant of the late capitalism. It's, nothing is right there. Uh, and if it disappeared tomorrow, I don't think anybody would have an issue with it. Um, so it's hard to make a relevant building in a place that is completely irrelevant. One of the questions was how a country projects its identity. And what we thought was fascinating is that Morocco made a building for these international exhibitions, the same building before the French colony, during the French colony time, and after. I'm not only showing two of them, but the, we participate in every single one, but always showing the same tiles, arcades, moucharabie, and so on and so forth. We wanted to take a strong position by saying, maybe in a place like Morocco, which is a strange intersection between the north and the south, between the east and the west, it's a place of exploration. It's one of the rare laboratory for what we do in the world. So we decided to propose a building that is a city or a city that is a building. Something that talks about a multiplicity, that talks about a street experience, you know, Borges has this beautiful um, definition of a labyrinth. He says, I'm going to try to translate it in English, the scariest labyrinth you can see is a labyrinth in a straight line. The entire building is organized around a street that winds down all the way to the ground and that touches these volumes that are suspended in completely different places. So you never know where you are inside the volume. You can enter into a volume, do three turns of the ramp, and then find yourself at the ground of the same volume after you've seen five other places. This sense of multiplicity, of integrating the garden, of making a building that has no air conditioning in a place where you could have 48, 50 degrees, um, was a testament of how architecture isn't about comfort, 
which we'll talk about later, but is that making even complicated places livable. This relationship between the garden, the earth, the wood, the ramp, isn't a literal translation of what you would live if you were inside an old winding street of the Medina, but it's the sense of loss, discovery, and community that you can have. All of the buildings I'm going to show, I will try to speak only about one aspect of it. Obviously, um, you'll see that the question of materiality, of experimentation, of the relationship to the body is always so incredibly important to us. Lastly, in this question of climate, we have been obsessed with the notion that buildings should go beyond being the carapaz, being shelters, which is, seems to be the most primordial definition of architecture, protecting you from the element. We consider that there needs to be a form of negotiation, of breathing between the elements and architecture. And we love working in weird, complicated places. This building is a high school uh, that is under construction right now in the middle of the desert, right by the sea, but in the middle of the desert. And it's a place where kids come and stay here. They have an internet, but they stay here all year. Um, so it has a sense of a place where you live during the day, at night, where you live during the summer and during the winter. And in the desert, during the day, it's very hot, and at night, it's very cold. So instead of having part of the city next to the other part of the city where you live and when you, when you work, we put it one on top of the other. The city where you are during the day is below and the city where you stay is above. So the building protects itself and creates a sense of interiority, of a microclimate, almost of a tropical, of a tropical um, dimension. So it's not a roof. It's literally a space carved within the building. This is for us a way to consider that climate and nature are things to be engineered, to be invented, not to ne pas subir, not things that you have to deal with. Okay, now the scary part. We're 2023. I'm not going to give many numbers, even though I'm the geekiest uh, person you, you will meet today. Mm -hmm. But in 20 years, well, uh, let me start again. In 1960, there was one billion people living in, in uh, urban areas. Today, we're three and a half billion people living in cities. In 20 years, we're going to be six and a half billion. That's three billion people that will live in cities in the next 20 years. That's building a city of three million inhabitants, the size of Lebanon, Lebanon, every week, every week we have to build one. There's no urban systems wherever, neither in Africa, Europe, America, Asia, that can withstand that kind of growth. And nowhere we have the tools uh, to imagine these things. There's a few things in the tradition of architecture where we use them as speculative dimensions the ideal cities, the explorations of archi ground, this notion that cities were used as a critical tool to have a conversation about society, modernism, industrialization. The problem of all these prophetic projects, uh, speculation, is that in the end we built them. And as we built them, we just uh, canceled our capacity to invent the future because the future we invented is actually quite horrible. Yet, we have absolutely no choice than to start thinking about new ways of making cities. This is Los Angeles. It's the richest city in the richest country in the world. And you have shortages of power, shortages of water for the past 15 years, and it's only gonna get worse. The water to, that comes to Los Angeles travels 600 kilometers. The gas, 300 kilometer. Oil, all utilities are not dependent on where the territories are. So this question that all our contemporary cities for the past 100 years have come out of their chains 
because the infrastructure comes from very far, poses questions that are completely new to us. The war in Ukraine is showing us that gas is a problem, petrol is a problem, food shortages are a problem. This notion that infrastructure is global poses question of sovereignty, justice, equality, social inequity, gender issues. Our position is that we will have in the coming century reinvent how to make cities within boundaries. Infrastructure used to be visible. It used to be part of landscape. It used to be part of a communal management, uh, whether it's the Roman aqueduct, whether it's the basins of the southern of Morocco, the ritual uh, wells of India, or even the uh, wells in the Campo in Venice. You've all, some of you have been to Venice. Each Campo has a well. It is dimensioned for a certain amount of people that live there. Once there's more people, they move to a different place. We have to reinvent cities that are finite. And this notion of finite um, seems strange for a city. Le Corbusier called this uh, uh, la cité d'habitation de grandeur conforme, meaning of a certain dimension. That for this to work, it's uh, 1,660 people. Once it was too big, didn't work. If it's too small, it doesn't work. There's this notion that there's a dimension for things to work. So can we do this with cities? Well, we tried. Um, we were working on a series of new townships, and this is an incredible, beautiful place. It's 3,500 uh, 3, hectares. It's humongous. It's the site of the city of Paris without the, the tuba. And the way we've looked at it is to see what we could do only on that site, looking at its topography, creating dams to harvest the water, protecting them with greenways, integrate a series of circulation system, transform the entire territory into an agri uh, agricultural system, and then start densifying the agricultural territory as forms of colonies very gently. And every time the density is achieved, then you move to other territories. This city is designed for 150,000 people. The reason why it works is because the state cannot provide what it should, which is bring the water, bring the electricity, bring the sewage system, bring the road, bring the, the, the phone lines. So you have to rely only on what's there. Can we make a territory that is based only on what you can find and create different kinds of landscape for it? This, we've developed it this project was 15 years ago. We've developed it looking at different dimensioning elements. And obviously it's not to say that we're gonna go back to making walled cities or castles. Obviously the perimeters are a lot protéiform, but this notion that a city has no limit and can grow endlessly is an impossibility. We are also exploring ways in which we have to live in places that can't be lived anymore. This is a, an, um, an experiment we did for the Venice Biennale in, in 2014 that we called fundamentalism, where we gave one cubic kilometer of desert to eight different architects. So that's one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. And we told them, show us how we can live there. What kind of experience? How do we live together? How do we harvest the water? What kind of organization we can recreate amongst ourselves? And obviously, these are all speculative elements. But the interesting part of speculative projects is that a few years later, you can start re-looking at them, revisit them. And this is what we had done. We had said, in this one kilometer by one kilometer element, we're going to carve the ground and we're going to build the sky. We're going to find a, a way in which the city during the day is buried and then the city during the night is above. And it's based on this work um, that we've developed the project of the high school I've shown you earlier on. This is an interesting example of how speculative research then gets percolating uh, gently into the work of the office. Obviously, it's a carceral ex experimentation. It should never be taken literally, but it has some beautiful and possibilities inside almost Piranesian-like. Mm -hmm. Lastly, 
we are convinced that our humanity, we're going to have to reinvent a form of nomadism in places that we won't be able to be stuck in one places. So right now, there are nomads, obviously. They're either the very rich or the very poor. Um, there are people who have too many choices or people who have no choices. Um, the UN considers that between now and 2050, there will be 600 million refugees. <coughs> Climate, war, famine. And as architects, we have a responsibility to just even look at it. 600 million people that will be en transhumance, that will be roaming the planet. And the last invention that exists, that has been done, is the tent that the UN has invented in 1948 and hasn't changed. And uh, I know that here you're all too familiar with this uh, landscape. How can we find ways in which cities move, community organize in territories? It doesn't have to be um, without cycle. They can be moving and coming back. There needs to be ways in which infrastructure is biodegradable. There needs to be ways in which architecture isn't always founded. <coughs> and all this question of um, uh, nomadic cities or non-permanent cities don't, are not always tragic. Uh, this is Burning Man. It's a temporary city for a few weeks, and then it gets moved on to different places. So we decided to reconsider an old form of architecture, um, almost primordial, which is the opposite of the house. Um, that's the tent. And we, we build a lot of tents. We like them. Uh, we like to explore with them because they're extraordinarily powerful. Um, they have a sacred dimension because they exist in absolutely every culture, from the tipi to the yurt to the tent of the Berber. Every civilization invented a form of something that is tensile, light, and that can move. But we haven't really explored these architectural possibilities. Um, a few years back, we did uh, this project as a temporary installation for l'Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, which is using a very old fabric, which is made out of camel uh, wool, uh, that is sewed in the desert in the southern Morocco, but all the way to Chad. But we wanted to define it in a completely different form. Here, it's not a traditional tense, the topography, it's something that's raised from the ground. And we created it as a way of communicating between two buildings, l'Institut du Monde Arabe and Jussieu on the other hand. Um, I'll always remember um, Jean Nouvel, who was my last boss, uh, coming to the opening of this and sitting exactly here, I kid you not. And he looks at it, it's like, il est vraiment pas mal mon bâtiment. <laughs> my building is not so bad. <laughs> it's typical. But the interesting part is that it's not about any kind of orientalism or tropi tropicalism. It's really ways in which we can explore temporary settlements. And we've done it at a much greater scale for the village of the COP22 that was in Marrakech. That was a, a small neighborhood for 70,000 people that gathered. And the figure that we created was this amazing canopy that was a kilometer and a half long, which used became the space where everybody uh, gathered instead of being in windowless uh, meeting rooms. And we recreated a landscape under it that went from the driest one to the wettest one using the slope. It's an extraordinarily simple idea, but the very moving um, part was how everybody appropriated this territory. But the tent is also a shelter for beyond human, for nature, and we're doing this project for the Pavilion of Luxembourg in the World Expo in Osaka in, in 2025, where we considered that humans and plants and trees and birds can all be acclimated uh, together within a single figure. Okay, let's move on to our bodies. One of the elements that will be very easy here to explain, but I have a lot of it needs a lot longer explanation when I uh, have to explain this in America or in Europe. It's this notion of transgression. Um, 
people never do what they're told and what they're supposed to do. And if you try to fight it, you fail. You have to embrace the notion that as architects, you design possibilities. You don't, people are not Playmobiles, okay? They're not gonna do what you think they're going to do. And what we take this and we try to push it as far as possible as part of the agenda of our project. This is a project we were asked to do, um, which was an underground parking in the heart of the city of Rabat, at the intersection of the two busiest streets. And there was a rundown market that was used. And we proposed two very simple things. We took two streets around it and we made them pedestrian. Okay, that seems easy enough. And instead of actually making the parking, we took one level of the parking and we made it into a commercial space that's just slightly sunken, so that it's protected. We had no idea what would happen there. And in Morocco, like in many places, they like to inaugurate buildings. So this building stayed like this for three years with nobody going on it, because they didn't really know where to start how it could be used because public space is always a dangerous thing if you don't know what to do with it then it needs to be polished um, that's why they always put something in the middle they put a clock put a fountain put a patinoire um, and we fought with everybody on this project to put uh, nothing in it i have a beautiful drawing of, of the king who just came back from uh, New York in the winter and who saw the Rockefeller Center and said, why don't we put a patinoire uh, under? <laughs> the idea of void in the middle of the city is always an anguish. It's a place of negotiation, of informalities, of uncertainties. And we try to embrace them. So after a while, they just left the space. The parking was working, the, the shops were closed. And slowly, people started to get adjusted to it. It's the biggest difference between architecture and urbanism. In architecture, we work with finite dimension. We can be in control to a certain point. When you start touching the city, it's alive, it's organic. You, when you touch it, you don't know how it's going to react. Um, and in this case, it took a lot of time. And one day, um, I was traveling somewhere and a friend of mine sent me this picture. They were looking for a stage somewhere for a big concert and they decided to go there because it was the only open space that existed. I saw this picture and I called my insurance company um, because obviously the building wasn't designed for this. But now it's becoming a place not just of transgression, but we've carved within the program that was given us a public prerogative that we thought was fundamental. You've seen a lot of buildings that are freestanding, floating. It's true that we're not very good uh, architects of small spaces. Um, we don't do many d'encreuses, you know, infill buildings. But we decided to do this project in Paris, which is a cultural center, in a very tiny plot, 10 meters wide by 30 meters deep. And it's a cultural center of Morocco inside Paris. And instead of, again, having a heavy statement of identity, we decided to look at what are the cultural intersection. And there's something about the medieval area of Cluny and the old towns of Morocco. Small street, vertical elements, nothing is simply one element, it's all about multiplicity. Nothing is extruded, everything is about the right of air. And we decided to do, in a, this very small 300 square meter lot, a, a small uh, element of aggregation that created a street in the middle of it. The reason why we did the street that crossed the building, because the plot allowed it, is because it's in a very dead area of Paris, in the Boulevard Saint-Michel, in the, in the southern part of it. And by this little street created just a shortcut between two parks, let's say. So even if people don't want to come to this building, they come to this building because it's the shortest way to go from one place to another. And we just wanted to make sure that we wanted to plug some energy into this uh, architecture and have a conversation with the city of Paris that is not always about continuity. Um, my wife describes this building as a 
a small building that thing that is very big you know kind of a, a little bit pretentious and maybe it is because it's trying to uh, recreate forms of interiorities complexities patios intersection ways in which you can look diagonally within the spaces um, to recreate the sense of fabric Okay, lastly, this notion of transgression has a lot to do with the gift you do to the city. This is a sports center uh, in a mining town, very, very boring. But you have the people who work for the mining company who get to go inside, and you have the people who live in the city who don't get to go inside. So instead of putting the building against the edges, we push the building the third inside the site, as you can see, and created a crust that's about 350 meter long, where all the elements of the usages and the program that exist inside have a reflection outside in a public uh, garden and park that is given with a thick space of threshold that is negotiated between the inside and the outside. So the limit of the building isn't to the left, it's to the right. And that space is a place of shade, of discussion, negotiation, transgression, pollinization, that wasn't really asked of us. This is. You can do it also in very boring buildings. Uh, this is a, a building inside a business district. Uh, it's an office building. Just so happened that it's extremely dense. There is no street. The streets are all, they have nothing in them. So we decided to create the public space within the building. What you see here is that there's a small plaza on the outside. And we created an internal plaza on the inside that's completely public within the building. And by doing this, you have to do a bit of a architectural kamasutra. You, know? you have to uh, do a little bit of transformation to allow for these possibilities. And that alone makes the architecture Maybe not necessary, but at least useful. Okay. Something that's important to us. When we a get asked to do a building, we always, n we never think whether, how it should be, or what it looks like, or how it's going to be used. The first question we ask is, should we do it? Is it absolutely necessary? 99% of architecture that gets built should not be built. There's more than, there's plenty of what's there that needs to be re-looked at. In order for us to decide to do something, we have to be able to answer to its absolutely, almost ontological necessity. If not, we say, well, let's find different ways of doing it. I talk about cannibalization because architecture has always been done with architecture. It's impossible to think of the city of Rome uh, looking at the Vatican built with the marbles of the Forum. It's literally the material of this used for the material of that. And we have to learn how to re-cannibalize architecture almost in a body-like, you know, in, in its own, own meat. This is a... I show this image because it shows how that works at, at an urban dimension. This is the city of Lucca, where the Colosseum has been reused as a housing element rebuilt uh, in the 12th century. And inside each of these, you can see the rhythm of the uh, perpendicular walls that gave the rhythm of that. It's literally uh, attached to it. And we always think of architecture as this meaning a radical proposition, but also the possibility of a transformation. Um, I love this building. It's, it, it was built in the early 50s in Casablanca. And it, it was built by Condilis and Woods, the people who then designed the Free University of Berlin. And the idea was so generous. They were thinking, we need to modernize the Arabs. The Arabs lived in small little towns with a little patio. The civilizational jump is to have people live in vertical patios. The section of this building is incredible. The abstraction, no windows, no doors, nothing. 
And when I started working in Casablanca uh, with, uh, 1995, uh, we were working on a book um, and I was asked to go photograph it. I had the exact address. I could not find it for three hours for it looked like this. And for me, those are the equally important side of architecture. You have to have a powerful agenda, but in the end, they didn't need a suspended patio. They just wanted one more room. And this building is so much more beautiful as it's been transformed and reinterpreted because it shows the absolute limitations of what we do. If we think that this is not as good as this, we have to change our profession. Our buildings have to leave some room. A building that is finished is dead. We have to design buildings where we have to leave space for what's informal, not predictable, and maybe not even desirable. But if the building cannot swallow it, then it will be demolished. So we spent a lot of time looking at building and repairing them. Um, we worked in the city of Fez for many years, and we still do. And we repaired many caravanserai. Caravanserai are places where craftsmanship used to happen. And there are several buildings. And it just so happened that two of them, one built in the 13th century and one built in the 14th century, were next to each other, but accessible from different streets and at different levels. Nobody even imagined that they were connected. And when we re-looked at them, we decided to rebuild them, not at all by saying, I'm going to bring a contemporary agenda and design it with steel and concrete. We build them with absolutely exactly the same materials. Wood. Um, bricks, round earth, ceramics, obviously with a um, contemporary expression, but the materiality was up, just orthodox, because you can. There's very few places in the world where the workmen still know how to build like you used to build in the 16th century, so why not take advantage of it? I can tell you now that the people working in Notre Dame would like to have this kind of people, yet you can create an interesting connection between these two buildings that didn't used to have one, because one of them has been burned in two thirds and the other one is in very bad shape. So we created this connection all along the wall where the figure of the patio completely disappears because it becomes almost um, a place of circulation between the, the two spaces. Repairing doesn't mean bringing back to an original moment that is a phantasm that doesn't exist anymore. It means taking stock of what is there and thinking something uh, very simple. These buildings were there before us. They hopefully will be there after us in many different possible ways. It creates some pretty extraordinary spaces. And it can be done without necessarily an architectural statement, sometimes it's okay to disappear. Maybe not entirely, but to be quite discreet. I wasn't going to show this, but after the, after the, the tour that Nicolas uh, very nicely gave me of uh, Beirut, I wanted to show some of the work we do for the 20th century patrimoine. This is the city of Casablanca, for which in the past uh, six years, we've identified 3,500 buildings that needed to be preserved out of 9,000 buildings inside the city center. So we're talking about the greatest urban and architectural adventure of the 20th century with no regulation before. So we've identified these buildings, we created an inventory rules of transformation, how they can be used, transformed, and then re-inhabited, but mostly forbid their demolition. I'm just going to very quickly show some images, not necessarily need to, to comment them. Uh, some of it will ring a bell to what you see in this incredible city of Beirut. And what's beautiful about the, our colonial territories isn't that they used models of what they were building in the metropolis, is that these models mutated. And in these mutations, beautiful things were discovered. And this notion of acclimatation of architectural form, shape, morphologies, écriture, is extraordinarily important um, 
um, in the way we look at our work, which is never something that is pure, but always as part of a very long continuum of uh, transformation. And we also were, um, had to deal with some of these buildings. And one of the earliest buildings uh, built on the main boulevard was what they called L'Immeuble Sonneau, L'Hotel Lincoln, which isn't a very interesting building, but it's the last of its generation. 1915, it's kind of neo-moresque. And it was very important because it crystallizes um, the recent understanding of this 20th century patrimony in Casablanca. What you see in the left is the building as it was in the 30s to the right, the way we're transforming it. It doesn't look like we're doing much, but our proposal is quite simple. About two-thirds of the facade was gone. Everything inside was gone. So we said something simple. What is there, we'll repair. What is not there, we'll completely reinvent. But we don't reinvent by making a heavy statement. We just took the existing building and we used it as a mold for the new building, so that everything is in negative. Just the shadows are in negative. Everything else is the same, but the mode de nature is just reversed. So that if you don't squint and you just walk, you're quite respectful to it. But the materiality is different, and there's just an inversion of, of shadows. I'm going to finish with this notion that the enemy of architecture is comfort. Everybody likes comfortable homes. And it's true that the suburbs of LA are comfortable. And it's true that the city of Venice isn't comfortable. But one will last and not the other. If we stop thinking that we have to make an effort, that it's, that it's not okay to be cold, that it's not okay to be hot, that it's not okay to go upstairs or downstairs, then architecture will disappear because our relationship physical, visceral, material, sensual, has to do with exertion, has to do with the change of temperature, has to do with thresholds. Um, we did this building uh, in 2015 um, in Milan for the World Expo, and it was one of our earlier exploration of round earth. And here, we did it inside wooden frames that allowed us to use exactly one single element of construction to one module that then be assembled. But we proposed a building not just without um, air conditioning, but without weather threshold. If it rains outside, it rains a little bit inside. The openings that you see are not windows. They're just openings. And there is a rope just for the water to, to slide down. And if there's water, then it falls a little bit on the ground. If it's um, 37 outside, it's 28 inside. It's not 15. If it's uh, 12 uh, outside, it's uh, 24 inside. Buildings breathe. They make you uncomfortable, and they should, because that's how you appreciate them. You will never forget Venice. You'll always forget Orange County. And. It's difficult to explain to a client that you're gonna make him a space that is not comfortable, that it's okay to make weird things. You've seen lots of stairs and plaza and things carved in and things above, and it's so incredibly important to put back our bodies in motion um, so that they can recreate memories. I always show this image. Um, I don't know if, if this kind of typologies exist in Lebanon, but all throughout, northern Africa, you have these walls that we call msalat. Um, they're just sitting randomly in the landscape. They're usually rural. And during the day, you see kids playing soccer around them, and so on and so forth. Yet, the outdoor mosques that are used once a year uh, after Eid al-Adha for one prayer. The rest of the time, they're not used. But in everybody's memory, they're dimensioned. And it's a single line, it's a single line in the territory that holds the memory of what happens there. And this relationship uh, to the line, to the landscape, to the traces, um, we've experimented it with 
a project of two houses in the middle of nowhere that we decided to put next to each other. We didn't have to. And because of where the site was, we, they needed to be extremely thin. We're talking about things that are five meter wide by 80 meters long that are completely open to, um, to the spaces, to the outdoors, that in order to go from one room to the next, you have to go outside, and if it's raining, or if it's too hot, or if there's a dog, or whatever, it's, you, you are always engaged uh, in that relationship. As a conclusion, I just want to say one thing. Um, you understood how visceral we attach to the necessity of, of architecture. But probably the conclusion we got to in the past few years with Lina is that if we were to continue to, to do this, we have to dehumanize architecture. We have to take human out of architecture or out of the center of architecture. We can't just build for humans. We have three kinds of prerogatives and we often mix them. The first one, is our relationship to our client. We have a contract, he pays our bills, we deliver documents. But it's not because he pays our bills that he gets to decide everything because our second prerogative has to do with the public. If you ask me to build something, I'm still delivering it for everybody that's gonna walk in front, people are gonna live inside, people are gonna go through it. This second prerogative is often in tension with the first one. And I think I've showed you how we carve this public prerogative of the private relationship. And it's true that in most part of the world, architecture becomes service industry, and we're stuck in this first silo of providing a service. But we can resist and say, we have to provide a service for people who are in no relationship with. They can, your client can ask you to do stupid things, and you have to be able to say no, and you have to do different things from within, and you have to transform it because in the end, you're going to leave something that has nothing to do with your owner. But the third one is the most important one to me, is each and every building has to témoigner. I don't know how do you say témoigner in English, because it's not witness. has to uh, be there for everything that's alive, not just humans. Our buildings have to have crevices, have to have new dimensions for insects, animals, for everything that is alive that's going to make us hopefully uh, continue this path a little longer. Thank you. Thank you, David, for this uh, very condensed, I would say, and... Uh, 50 minutes. 50. <laughs> but with material words, like... Uh, 120 and more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I, I would like to start uh, more of a, a kind of a comment of a pattern that uh, I find in uh, like some projects find uh, similar, I would say, properties to how you make uh, architecture, uh, which is uh, trying to uh, find the stereotomic design that allows uh, out of a uh, total language for the project. So for example, um, the Expo Dubai shares a lot of this, um, I would say, uh, massing, or like the, the presence of the mass with, let's say, the school in the desert, like similarly of how you can start uh, forming mass and allowing voice to dictate uh, the life of the building. Mm -hmm. So is this uh, something that, um, is finding a threat in many of your projects? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is an inner question, question of, you know, inside baseball, how, how you make things. But you never know what a project starts with. You really, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's a smell, an intuition, a thickness. The worst part is that when you have a, an idea that comes too quickly, those are the worst ones, because then you have to fight them for months. But however it starts, I always ask myself, what is its smallest constituents? What is its uh, smallest element? 
and how can this uh, smallest element multiply or transform? So um, you will see it's a very granular form of architecture, if you want, but I'll take just one example to explain this. Okay, so here, everything outside is a very uh, heavy language of glass, double scale, and so on and so forth. We wanted the building with no scale, so you can't really tell whether it's six floors or 20 floors. So we defined um, a rhythm where the floor is divided by three, and we have these concrete blocks that are two tons each, huge, where each block varies two centimeters from the one next to it. The wider it is, the more pushed in it is, the thinner it is, the more it comes out. And that's how you just create a sense of differentiation inside. So what, what was important was to find what is that one element. And then you think about what are the transformations that it, that it uh, can operate and why it's there. Um, this notion of the units the, is, is a way to try to go beyond the relationship, very Renaissance-like, classical relationship, between an element and the whole. So in every composed architecture, the element is associated with other elements. They make a bigger element that gets associated, and, and so on, and so on, and so forth. Um, that's the Palazzo del Te, that's uh, every Le Corbusier building. We try to, to find ways in which the smallest element find its own generative or degenerative properties to transform everything else. In this building, it's one element that's 93.5 uh, centimeter square that is developed itself in plan, section, and elevation. So every dimension is like this, which creates something very strange because then no floor plates are the same height. No relationship from the inside to the outside uh, is the same, but it allows to have it, in a very small building, a disjunction between what is out and urban and what's inside. So it's true that I often wonder what is the smallest part, and then how can that smallest part not be divided and can be multiplied, if it makes any sense. So I, I was telling Sandra that in a situation like this, I often take a student and I bribe them to start the first question, because the first question is always the, the hardest. But was it clear? Did you understand what I'm trying to say? It wasn't discouraging. It didn't want to say, I'm going to go to medicine tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> but of uh, mixed feelings, while we are calling for to teach how to build less or not to build, yet you are offering a temptation to build nicely. So how would you resolve this uh, dilemma? I mean, it's, ethically, we should we should be responsible for building less or for not building. I think it, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Um, we should be responsible for not building. And whenever you build, it needs to be such an extraordinary alignment of star that make it necessary. I started by saying that architecture is always a deterioration of its environment. Always. There's never a moment where architecture makes a place better. Never. Uh, you go into a beautiful vineyard and you ask uh, Rafael Moneo to make uh, uh, a place for the vine, the, the visitor to come in. Great architect, beautiful site. It's still better without it. Just no question. Yet, there's sometimes a necessity for it. because. There's still people who can't shelter. There's still people who don't have access to portable water. There's still people who need to go to school. There's still territories that need to be uh, colonized and other ones given back to nature. But the reason I'm, I sound caricatural is because I want the student to consider that the act of building is an extraordinarily violent one, never to be taken lightly. And when I see a young architect or a student just drawing things, you know, because they can. I just want you to understand what it actually means for the ground you're putting it, for the people that are going to be working there. If you can answer the necessity 
not just it's kind of cool or I'd like to do this just you have to tell you have to convince me that even though it's something that's going to be difficult I need to do it and then if you're uh, invested uh, in a visceral way like in your gut with the necessities for it then it's a it's a safeguard because we're all mighty we're mini gods we each of our buildings is a world it's a universe in which we're the masters if you don't have within you the limits of it then it can be dangerous I don't know if I answered your... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, after all, architecture is a sin, and it's how we qualify the sin. And like any sin, it's beautiful. Yes. Especially when it's done with cement. But I wonder, actually, for our students, what message they are coming out of this lecture with? Is it an invitation to build more or to build less? It's an invitation that if you have to build, um, do it right. I'm not sure I am, but... Um, so. You know, I'm usually a funny guy, right? And you didn't come across tonight, but... Um, but what we do is, is... I mean, it's dangerous, it's complicated. We play with people's lives. So we can't do it lightly. We can... Um, we have to feel invested with some sort of mission. Something. Otherwise, do something else. If, if you're in this to make money, in the wrong field. Um, if you're in this because you want to be to exist, to to put statements forward, you should have been born a century ago because this is not the time. It was the time, but not for us anymore. Your generation is going to be the one that will have to deal with inventing architecture in the harshest possible, most fluid, transformative condition possible, building with no foundation building with no roofs, building with people that changes all the time, people with people that work and live in it at the same time, things that have no stability, no references. And you so it's beautiful moments for inventing things, but it's also because it's so open-ended that we need to have a, a little bit of grounding. So I visited the campus today. I've seen lots of beautiful buildings. Some, part, I'm talking about the new ones, some don't really have to be there, and some are just in the right place. And you, can, you, you see it immediately. Now, once you see it, ask yourself why this one doesn't work and this one works. And if you can answer this, then it's a start. It's a, this campus is finite. There's no place to put any more building. So if you were to put a new building, be such a complicated issue. It's either a building or a tree. Which one do you keep? So um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting metaphor, the place that you're in. And uh, I, did, I was fortunate to do a, a review this afternoon. And I was incredibly impressed with the work of the, of the students, um, both in, in coherence, in quantity, in quality. All I wanted to tell them is, too small. Relax, relax. You don't have, you don't have to do too much architecture to do architecture. Sometimes it just happens by itself. Other questions? Does this building work good enough? Does it work well? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's, people who work in it love it. People who go visit it love it. Um, it took me a while to get it authorized because it's such an oddity inside the, the area. So uh, Parisians being very conservative, uh, we're not so hype about it. But um, yeah, it does. It works. And the, the, the one thing that we predicted would work, work. Meaning, imagine in a small 300 square meter lot, you're giving four meter wide to a street. Your client is like, no, 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 it's too small already. I said, no. Otherwise, nobody will ever come. Now, everybody just goes through. That's enough to create energy. So I think it works, yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you're 
mentioned how uh, architecture is meant to make you feel uncomfortable. So how do you convince people to go into buildings knowing that they won't be um, like comfortable inside? It's not meant to make you uncomfortable. It's just, it shouldn't try to make you too comfortable. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so, there's many kinds of architects and, and <coughs> they each have tricks to convince people they work with. I usually use people's memories because everybody lived in different spaces that they cherish, that they know that they visited. And, you know, if you go inside the Pantheon in Rome, it rains inside. It's, you can actually create a connection with people by tapping into their experience, both good and bad, and then oblige them to reevaluate what they ask you. That's one way to do it. That's the gentle way. That's usually my wife's way. I you just lie to them most of the time. <laughs> Are you good at it? Hmm? Good at it? Um, you should ask my wife. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask a question because you do so many uh, of Morocco in different places. So I see that uh, the way you try to do it is uh, there is a strong material interpretation of what Morocco can uh, be seen on an international uh, event. So I, I wanted to ask you about uh, you know, how does materiality uh, how do you push the interpretation of materiality uh, um, in those type of uh, projects? Be it, uh, you know, in the Biennale where sometimes the materiality is about the floor, the sand, yeah. or for example in others where, you know, I think you it deliver a, a tactile expression. It's, it's funny, I never thought about it, about this project, but materiality is a, it, or thinking about the sensuality of materiality is something that uh, I work with all the time. And um, it's the easiest thing to, it's the easiest part of architecture to create emotion. Because you really just want to do this. You know? yeah. it's, uh, you never want to do this on aluminum panel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, when we were driving around today, I, went, we, I visited the, uh, Lina Gotme's building. Mm. It's just beautiful, yeah. you know, you want to, you want to caress it. That being said, um, I think it's not about the materiality, but it's about how you transform it. In every project, it's, in, it's not about rather. It's about how you transform it to make it into something. It's not about concrete. It's how you reinvent the concrete. I can tell you that the smell of concrete in Volubilis, to this day, still have the smell of the cedar wood on it. It's just... So... Um, Architecture is a, is, a, is a trigger of memories. It's a, it has to engage, and the best way to engage is through materiality. So we, there's always an element, and there's always a materiality, and there's always a transformation. And obviously, within this, you can look at it also as a research, because from one project to the next, you, you progress, you develop. The, it's, we did Milan, and then from that we did uh, Dubai. We couldn't have done Dubai without having done this one. So. They're, they're increments, um, and each one pushes you to the next one. So I can't imagine an architecture that is not incarnated, that doesn't have a, a body, a mm -hmm. thickness, which is why yeah. I feel well in the Mediterranean, I'm in Germany, and I don't, I don't go to work in the Netherlands because it's distant and dry and cladded and, you know, and I like buildings that are naked and thick and with acne and, you know, you know, I'm from this place, I'm not from those places. Uh, a question about, about infrastructure. So basically we're looking at the visible part of architecture. And as we know, architecture and the built environment is supported by infrastructure, whether at the large scale or at the building scale, maybe referred to as technology. So you've built in, you've sh you showed projects in v remote areas and projects in the middle of dense context. So what's what's your uh, what are your views about 
how do you address the issues of infrastructure and technology at both scales? Okay, so at the scale of the territory and the city, it's easy for me to answer because we've worked on this for more than a decade, we've implemented it, we have a position. The reason why cities are failing, it's because the infrastructure is hidden and it's coming from far. If we want the cities not to fail, infrastructure has to become, again, part of the landscape, like I showed here. And because it becomes visible, its governance, the way it's managed, re-become municipalized, communal. Let me put it this way. And I think Lebanon is a good place to have this conversation. You have the public place, the public dimension. It's, it's the police, it's the firemen, it's, it's the, the, the regalian space. You have the private space, okay? Infrastructure or all conceded uh, services are in this gray area that are in the common space. They're not public, they're not private. And we, find, we need to find new ways to manage them as communities. When you open your tap water and it just comes down, you have no idea where it's coming from. You use it very differently than if you have to carry it on your head for 10 kilometers from the well. Obviously, that's a very radical example, but I am absolutely convinced that we have to redefine communal management of visible infrastructure amongst the people that use it. If you see it, you clean it. Mm -hmm. If you see it, you save it. And if you see it, it's part of your everyday landscape. It creates a dimension. It's a different issue with technology inside a building. And I think the scale is radically different. Um, if you work in the north, it's all about the performance of a building. How you reduce its footprint, how you make uh, the, the cooling, because you want to weigh not too much on the grid it's sitting on. If you work in the south, where people are poor, there is no grid. So there is no footprint. So it's about making the grid. So we spend a lot more time thinking about making the infrastructure than not weighing too much on it. I will never use the term sustainable development, sustainable design. I think this is one of the biggest um, hopes in the architectural school. If any of your teachers, I hope there's not one who disagrees, <laughs> talks about sustainable development, you should ask them, this is a way to validate all that toxic system I was talking about at the beginning. Sustain I will never talk about sustainability because I do it every day in my work. I never advertise it. And don't put label on a building. The question of performance is a crutch for an architectural that's not well designed. That's it. Uh, if you talk about environment, that means you have nothing else to talk about. That's a building that works well, that's well ventilated, that's well protected from the sun, that touches the ground well, that uses good material, that is sourced well, that's normal. So what? You did that. Umbet, what's the, what did you do? Nothing. You did uh, the work responsibly like anybody should do. Mm -hmm. The fact that we talk about this like it's an agenda means we skip everything else. Every building has to be built responsibly within the environment that allows it. The worst part of sustainability is that you impose a certain uh, framework, mindset, in places that are not capable of absorbing it. Try to do a sustainable building in Rwanda today. It would make no sense. You have to start from what the territory allows. And the, all the Leeds and Bream and HQE and all of these things are imposition of bureaucratic elements on territories that are not capable of dealing with them. In, in what we do, we are far more radical than any kind of sustainable development project you can see. A lot more radical. But you don't want to talk about this. That's just inside the kitchen, you know. It's, it's our job. We have to do it like this. So I rarely talk about the technology of the building because I think we have to consider it as a fait accompli. We should all consider it as part of our trade. Um, I talk about the moments where we try to push it a little bit further. So ecology, nature, 
things that are still alive worry me more than the HVAC system of my buildings. I don't know if it makes any sense. Um, I don't want to reduce architecture to a question of performance because I wouldn't know how to measure it. What is the performance <coughs> of... Let me show you this. What is the performance of Candidis? He did great. This is La Couverture Architecture d'aujourd'hui, 1953. They went with the CM10 with this. He couldn't have done better. Architecture and performance are almost antithetic with each other. Which is why when I was teaching in engineering school, they fired me after a while. <laughs> <laughs> because they need element of measurement. Not, I'm saying this as a joke, but what I'm saying is also a little bit scary because you think there is no element of measure of quality. There are, but measure of quality and performance are vastly different things. Mm, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.